a moment, we will bring you General Benjamin Franklin, starring Charles Lawson with Kathleen Lockhart on The Cavalcade of America. But first, here is Gaines Whitman for DuPont. Throughout the country, there are thousands of DuPont authorized refinishers, body repair and paint shops. They are specialists in smoothing out bumps and dents that mar the good looks of your car, in cleaning up rust spots along the door jams, window and cowl dents, where the old finish is worn out. These shops put on a factory match finish in DuPont Duco or Dulux so perfectly, you won't be able to find the places that have been repaired. Look at your car tomorrow. If it needs a touch-up or overall paint job, take it to the DuPont authorized refinisher before the rain and snow of winter cause more rust and corrosion. Duco and Dulux finishes are among the DuPont company's better things for better living through chemistry. America, the Pony Express. The covered wagon. America, the jet propelled plane. America means skyscrapers and haylofts, the crack of a pioneer's flintlock, and the sound of a riveter's machine, the glow of a fireside, and the glare of a blast furnace against the midnight sky. America is your story. America is you and everyone you know. Tonight, the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry, presents Charles Lawton with Kathleen Lockhart in General Benjamin Franklin on the Cavalcade of America. It is late at night in the stately Philadelphia mansion of Robert Hunter Morris, His Majesty's colonial governor for the Crown Colony of Pennsylvania. In his study, the governor reads over a letter he has just composed to the most distinguished American of that day. To Benjamin Franklin, Esquire, the French and Indian declaration of war has brought terror to the western border of Pennsylvania. Your appointment as a member of our committee for defense entitles you to know that at length His Gracious Majesty has been pleased to order General Edward Braddock and a force of British regulars to our rescue. It is hereby directed by request that you to... hereby directed by request that you repair to Frederictown, Maryland, for an earliest possible meeting with General Braddock. Believe me, sir, your most obedient servant, Robert Hunter Morris, Governor. Oh, Ben, you didn't even listen to me read this letter from the Governor. Pompous windbag. Fifteen words where one would suffice. Then what are you doing? Building a coffin. What? Building a coffin. What a horrible thing to say. Not at all, Debbie, it's true. Quite a creditable job. Ben Franklin, you may be a wit at the assembly, but I'll not have you testing your sayings on me. I love you, Debbie. Not for the world would I use your beautiful head as a sounding block. Ah, there, it's done. A little paint and Mistress Katie will be pleased, I'm sure. Mistress Katie, Ben, what are you saying? Now, what about Mistress Katie? That's not for her. Oh, no. It's for her squirrel. Oh, now, Ben, begin at the beginning. It's for her pet squirrel, my dear. Died last night. Our attempts to doctor it were unsuccessful. So that's where you were until after midnight, <laughs> doctoring a squirrel. Debbie, to little Mistress Katie, the squirrel was more than a pet. It was a way of life. The center of an orbit round which Katie's existence moved. Oh, Ben. With things the way they are, with the French and the Indians threatening our very homes, you stay up until all hours doctoring a squirrel for a neighbor's child. Would you have me any other way, Debbie? Of course not, dear. But now, what about this letter? Oh, I suppose I shall have to take a coach to Fredericktown and meet General Braddock. What's the time? There's a watch. Watch? Oh, uh, I took it apart. I'd forgotten. Again? <laughs> oh, well. 
Never mind. You can take the evening coat. You'll have plenty of time, but you'd better get tidied up. This suit's all right, my dear. Is that all wrong, thing? You're going to meet a general, then. I am sure the general will be splendid enough for both of us, my dear. <clears throat> now I've got to hurry. Where's, where's my wetkin? Here, where you threw it. On the floor. Thank you. Now, what are you hurrying uh, for? You've got to this evening. Oh, no, no. Oh, no, no, no. The funeral set for two o'clock. I promised Katie we should have a grand funeral. <laughs> General Braddock, sir? This is Mr. Benjamin Franklin. I am honored, sir. My honor, General. Well, that'll be all, Captain. Yes, sir. You were delayed, Mr. Benjamin? Delayed? Oh, no, no, no. The coach was on time. Oh. Would you sit down? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Martha Madeira, Mr. Franklin. Yes, if you please, sir. Your help, sir. Thank you. Uh, General Braddock, as a member of the Defense Committee, I am here to place myself at your service. <laughs> Frankly, and you're a civilian. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to hurt your feelings, but a successful military campaign requires the scientific knowledge of professional soldiers. Forgive me, sir, but the art of war is a life's work. The time we're better spent in the science of avoiding war, General. <clears throat> yes, that may be, but we have war now. The king has ordered me here with two line regiments to sweep the French and their Indian allies from the Ohio. I propose to get on with it. I propose, sir, to help you in any way I can. Good. My idea was to raise a volunteer army, a militia of citizens. Citizens? You mean farmers, trappers, tradesmen and whatnot? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, better than nothing, I suppose. On the contrary, sir, not only do we Americans believe that a man fights better for his own soil than an imported soldier would, but our militiamen know the enemy. I venture to say that the skilled might of His Majesty's forces will prevail. Gad, so an Indian is merely a man with a musket, after all. Or a man with arrows, sir. Arrows are silent. In the forest, they come from nowhere. At any rate, sir, I plead with you not to send your columns into the forests in mass array, wearing those scarlet coats of theirs. Some of us have learned valuable lessons from Indian fighting. You know our general, uh, our colonel, sir, George Washington, of course, sir. I suggest that you rely on his advice. I think you said he was a colonel. Yes, uh, yes, yes. I see, uh, General, as I see the point all too clearly. Then see this clearly, if you will, sir. My orders are from the king. I am to attack and destroy Fort Duquesne and the enemy there. I have my regulars and I'm in command. But colonel Washington says... He is not in command. Uh, um, Franklin. Yes, sir. Perhaps if you were a soldier, you would understand these matters. Oh, by the way, were you ever a soldier? Oh, yes, I was one. Oh, it's good, excellent. Where did you serve, sir? I uh, took my turn at sentry duty during King George's War. It was some years ago. Sentry duty? What was your rank, Mr. Franklin? Common soldier, General. I see. But you were, of course, in combat. I seem to remember having seen muskets fired, sir, or heard them, but as for coming to a brush with the enemy, I cannot claim that. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite a responsible position, General. I guarded some cannon Governor Clinton had mounted. Uh, the cannon were loaded. I think. Oh, <laughs> come, Franklin. <laughs> Don't be so serious. This is only going to be a skirmish at best. Indians may be a formidable enemy to you colonials, but are the king's regular and disciplined troops? I should say. Very well, General Braddock. I pray, of course, for the entire success of your expedition. <laughs> More than half of them killed, destroyed. I knew it, Debbie. I knew it. It wasn't your fault, dear. You did all you could. If he'd only listened to Washington, I can't blame him for disregarding my advice. I'm not a soldier, and I never will be. Now, but Washington... Now, sit down, dear. Now, what's to be done? I don't know, Debbie. Then you'd better eat something. I don't want anything, now, my dear. I've got to go and see Governor Morris. What good will that do? You've talked to him before, and he's never been enthusiastic about your defense plan. Well, he's got to be now, now that the Indians are breathing down his neck and Braddock's said, along with half of his force. Mm, this could be less of a younger man, dear. You'll be 50 soon. Debbie, we are defending our own homes in 50 or 150. I can't stop now. I'm going to see Governor Morris. And if he doesn't see eye to eye with me this time, I'll... I'll now, I'll... now, don't quarrel with him, dear. I have the greatest respect for Governor Morris. <laughs> Mr. 
begging your pardon, Governor Morris. Benjamin Franklin is here to see you. Franklin? What does he want again? I don't know, Your Excellency. Oh, this man's more trouble than the Indians. He had a good plan, sir. I'll be the judge of that. Oh, I'd have him come in. Yes, sir. Ah, Franklin, come in, come in. Your Excellency, I'm delighted to see you again. Thank you, I'm delighted to see you. Dreadful thing, Franklin, dreadful thing, Braddock's defeat. It was more than that, Your Excellency. Huh? What do you mean? It was the end of our protection. The people, sir, are demanding protection. Well, what can I do? Braddock was a good general. He was an excellent general and an extremely courageous man, but that was not enough. Well, what can I tell the people? What you intend to do, of course, sir. Um... Yes, of course. Um, yes, Your Excellency. Oh, nothing, nothing. Well, confounded Franklin, don't just sit there. What do you suggest? Volunteer militia, Your Excellency. These people aren't fighters. General Braddock's regulars were picked troops. Where are they now? It's absurd. I don't think so. These men will be fighting for their homes for America. I, I haven't got the right to authorize the organizing of militia. The proprietor isn't here. No, he's in London. Isn't there another plan? Yes, yes, there is another plan. We can sit quietly and let the Indians scalp us while we sleep. That would solve our problems. It would also necessitate recolonizing, sir. Oh, how can you joke at a time like this? Believe me, Excellency, I am not joking. Either we organize militia and defend ourselves, or we give up America. And I, for one, do not intend to do that. All right, all right, militia, then. Good. I'll inform the Assembly. Oh, uh, uh, just a moment. Since you're the originator of this plan, I think you should stay with it. What were you? Uh, the expedition is going to need a leader. Yes. A man, experienced, well liked, popular. We'll find someone. I uh, don't think there's a need to look further, Mr. Franklin. You're not talking about me, sir. I am. Oh, I, I am no soldier. If I appoint you, you will be. Appointing me doesn't make a soldier of me. I've known the head for battle. I'm, I'm a man of peace. I you were all for action a moment I ago. Still am, but action led by someone who is capable, sir. You know that I'm no soldier, Your Excellency, and I know it too. Take other hands than those that fire the musket to preserve this promising land of ours. So consider yourself appointed. The successful campaign may require a general. That's your Excellency, a general, and... Mr. Franklin. Um, is this, um, an order, Your Excellency? Considering so, no, Mr. Franklin. And I can do nothing else, but heaven help the campaign. You are listening to Charles Lawton as Ben Franklin and Kathleen Lockhart as Debbie in General Benjamin Franklin on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. As the second part of our story opens, Benjamin Franklin has convinced Governor Morris that recruiting volunteer militia is the only means of defending the colony of Pennsylvania. However, Franklin did not count on being appointed leader of the expedition, and just now we find him at his headquarters. Will someone please poke up the fire? Yes, General. And stop calling me General. Yes, sir. Uh, General Franklin, sir. Lieutenant, don't shout from the door. Close it and come in. Yes, sir. Well, what's the trouble with you? Uh, sir, I, I think the rain is going to turn to snow. Is that your opinion? I have you dispatch runners reporting from Jupiter Pluvius. Well, I... I thought you ought to know. Now that I do know, what can I do about it? Uh, uh, nothing, sir. Exactly. Uh, thank you, sir. Oh, just a moment, Lieutenant. Sir? Uh, thank you for telling me. You must forgive an old man his testiness and little temper. Soldiering is not in my order of things, you know. Of course, sir. You're wet. You sit by the fire and warm yourself. But I, I have work. You'll not be able to do it if you come down with cold and fever. Sit by the fire, Lieutenant. Why, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, there never was a good war or a bad peace. Sir, I must speak to you. Well, at least, Captain McLaughlin, you do not stand by the door shouting at me. Sir, we shall have to move immediately. Oh, why? No. The snow will make the trails impassable. And we must reach a defensible position by dawn. Yes, very well, we'll move. Hey, yes, sir? Where are those camphor balls? Right here, sir. Camphor balls, General? Yes, Captain McLaughlin, my dear wife, made me take them along to prevent me catching cold. Oh, I see, sir. They smell horrible. They do, sir. However, if they do not prevent the cold, they will serve one purpose. One purpose, sir? What is that? These camphor balls will keep any Indians off, provided the savage ra savages are upwind from us. Ah, 
this is a comfortable house, Captain McLaughlin. Yes, sir, it is. A Zupplinger's place. Now, I suppose we'll have to discuss this campaign. We will, sir. I have a map here of the region. Uh, uh, now, uh, it looks as though we shall have to give battle before we reach Gnadenhuten. Well? Yeah. Gnadenhuten. Oh, go on. Now, uh, here's Gnadenhuten. Don't say that again. I can see it on the map. <laughs> yes, sir. Here's the pass before Gnadenhuten. Yes, sir. Shall I go on? By all means. Thank you, sir. Now, if we get through the pass before dawn, we can reach Canadian Hoot. Just a moment, Captain. This pass is quite narrow, isn't it? Yes, General. And it would take us quite a while to move through it. Mm-hmm. But I think we can make it, sir. And if we didn't, we should be like the uh, Persians before the pass of Thermopylae. Persians, sir? Yes. Remember, Captain? Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. The Greeks held off a large Persian force at Thermopylae. Ah, yes, you know your classics. I doubt if the Indians have their Leonidas. We shall take no chance of being caught in the pass, flanked from all sides. But we must reach the Naval Houston. Captain, order Captain Isaac Wayne to move his company to the left, wide of the pass. Uh, Captain Fook to move to the rear. Captain Weatherholt to move up ahead, and your own attachment to stay well to the right. But, General, we are here, entirely unprotected. We shall keep a hundred men. A hundred? But against all those exactly. Indians? Exactly. I hope to make the Indians commit the main body of their force to an attack here. Well, I... It may work. It may not. Sir? You have something to add to this plan? Nothing, sir. He accepts it without question? You're my commander, sir. You think I'm a madman, Captain? No, sir. Your military bearing, Captain, is second only to your tact. What time is it, Captain? Time? A few minutes before dawn, sir. Uh Uh-huh. The Indian believes that if he dies before dawn, his spirit will not go to the happy hunting grounds. We have a few minutes. Are there any orders for me, sir? I don't think so, Captain. You just remain here. Here? In the house? While my company... Listen to that. There's the crack of dawn, Captain. I knew it. The Indians are attacking us here. They are. Let's hope it's the main body of their force. If it is, we'll never get back to Philadelphia, sir. Just a sir. The Indians attacking. Any orders? Fire back at them, Lieutenant. Those are all the orders, sir? They seem to be sufficient for the moment. Isn't that so, Captain McCracken? Lieutenant, have our men form a circle around the house. Wagons and equipment to be piled as barricades. Yes, sir. I should have thought of that, Captain. You knew we were in a trap here, didn't you, sir? I had some idea of it, yes. Have you a musket, sir? Musket? I don't think so. You're counting on our other companies to hear the fighting and close in. Isn't that it, General? That was in the mind, yes. Uh, they don't get here in time. If it's any comfort at all, Captain, Benjamin Franklin will die with you. Do you see any of the Indians? Yeah. Behind every tree and rock, but I, I can't see them. Sit down, Captain. Sit, sit down? Well, we're committed to this. If it works, well and good. If it doesn't, we may as well meet the thing calmly. Sit down, Captain. Sit down! down, Ben Franklin, and keep your feet in that hot tub. The big toe is floating, floating right off my foot, Tabby, blister and all. <laughs> Just a little while, it'll float right back on again. Yeah. <laughs> now move your feet up to the one side, or this hot water will scald you. Ow! That water's too hot, Debbie. Hmm, fine soldier. I never know how you survived all those weeks in the field. And the birthday, too. Yes, I know. You're past 50 now. I hope you'll begin to act your age. You do try to forget my age, Debbie, if only to save yourself by comparison. I heard all about it, Ben Franklin. What an utterly hot, foolhardy thing to do. Now, 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 Debbie, it's all over and done with. Oh, but you might have been killed, scout. Yes, there was a possibility. Possibility? You deliberately had those savages attack you. It's an old maneuver, my dear, for which I take no credit. I, I believe that Julius Caesar used it several times. I... I think it was a favorite trick of Alexander the Great. Ben know? Franklin, you're neither Julius Caesar nor Alexander the Great. I grant it, my dear Debbie. I'm not a gentleman of the sword, but rather of the pen. Where's the brown suit? I got rid of it. Debbie, that was a shabby trick. I loved that suit. Oh, Ben, Ben. You risked your life, and all you think about is that old suit. It was comfortable. It was a disgrace to the deputy postmaster and the general. Well, I'm not a general, Debbie, and I never was. It turns out that my appointment was as a colonel in the Philadelphia Regiment. And just as well. 
Steady. My feet aren't made for marching. Oh, it's a wonder they wouldn't give you a horse. They did, but the horse and I were at odds as to when I should go up and come down. So I marched. Now, who's that at this hour? Don't answer it, my dear. Don't be a goose. Might be important. Nothing is important but peace and quiet. Debbie, who is it? Debbie? The message for you, dear. Oh, open it, dear. Oh, no. No. What is it? Send me, send me as elected you to sail for England. What? Let me see that. Oh. Agent for Pennsylvania. Then you can't do it. You've just come back from that campaign. Then tell him you can't accept. That you won't accept. Let the younger men do it. My age favors me this time, Debbie. You've done your share, dear. Do you want me to stop, Debbie? You, in England... Well, you'll need a new suit. A brown one. If you like. <laughs> oh, Debbie, 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 Debbie. None of that now. Oh, you've done what you could then? No, I, I don't think so. I know now that men war upon each other, not knowing the reason, and you know that too, Debbie? I do, Ben, but you're only one man. One man from a new world, Debbie. Maybe, Debbie, maybe I can bring some of the hope for the peace of the new world to, this, this, to the distracted old world. Year in and year out, Europe sees new struggles for questionable ends. Men are too prone to put their squabbles to the test of fire. There never was a good war, nor a bad peace. <laughs> In a moment, our star, Charles Lawton, will return. But first, here is Jane Whitman speaking for DuPont. When your mother was a girl and went to the grocery to buy, let's say, soda crackers, the grocer man shooed the cap off the cracker barrel, reached down and handed the crackers over the counter in a paper sack. Most foodstuffs, and a good many other things, too, used to be sold in bulk. Packaging was developed by American business for a number of reasons. Cleanliness, convenience, accurate weight, and one last reason that's the most important of all, branding. When an American manufacturer prints his brand name on a package in big, bright letters, he is bidding for your attention, asking you to buy his product. But his brand is also a pledge. How so? If the product satisfies you, you buy that brand again. If it displeases you, you give it a cold look and a cold shoulder. A branded product, competing with many others, has to be good if the maker wants to stay in business. Women use the same brand of baking powder their mothers used because they know they can depend on it. Men buy the same make of car year after year, and competition is always there to keep the maker of that car on his toes. If you have ever traveled in a foreign country, you'll remember how glad you were to find a box of face powder or a pair of shoes with a familiar American brand on it. There was something you knew, something you could trust. The rules of good business never change. Hundreds of years ago, people bought from the makers whose products gave them better service. We all do the same thing today. A brand on the product we buy is a modern device that helps us to make our choice quickly and conveniently. Only a few of the many products of DuPont Chemical Science reach you directly. By far, the greater number of DuPont compounds are sold to manufacturers who use them in making the products, which they in turn sell to you. But every one of the thousands of boxes, barrels, and bags leaving a DuPont plant whether it goes to you or goes to industry, 
carries the DuPont brand that stands for a century and a half of experience and integrity in the manufacture of the DuPont Company's better things for better living through chemistry. And now, here is our star, Charles Lawton. As some of you may perhaps remember, a year or so ago, I had the pleasure of acting a quite different aspect of Benjamin Franklin's life than the one you've heard tonight. Benjamin Franklin, the soldier, was quite a new idea for me, as I imagine it was for most of us. The pattern for winning liberty has never been set. When the time comes, free men are able to take part freely in the battle for the beliefs they cherish. We see it today, Franklin saw it in his time. Calling, vocation, even age, is no barrier to service. Cavalcade brings you Brian Donlevy in the old Fall River Line. It's the romantic and nostalgic story of one of America's most colorful enterprises, the Fall River Line. The first stop on every traveler's list, from president to foreign diplomats and visiting celebrities. It's the story of Dan Hamilton, who fell in love with a boat on this famous line when he was 14 and spent the rest of his days ferrying boats across the old Fall River Line. You'll also hear Harry Von Tilzer's popular song about this thrilling boat trip. Be sure to listen next Monday to The Old Fall River Line, starring Brian Donlevy. Benedict Bogus production, A Miracle Can Happen. The music for tonight's DuPont Cavalcade was composed and conducted by Robert Armbruster. Our Cavalcade play was written by Zachary Metz. In the cast were George Zucco, Joseph Kern, William Johnstone, Junius Matthews, Jay Novello, Howard Duff, and Raymond Lawrence. This is John Easton inviting you to listen next week to Brian Donlevy in The Old Fall River Line on the Cavalcade of America, brought to you by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.